Hartford College students and faculty and staff, we're really pleased you're here. Before we get started, I just wanted to uh, say that how many of you have heard of Follow Our Lead? Ooh, okay. Well, you've all got t shirts. Follow Our Lead is our substance abuse prevention program here on Weatherford College, but it's mostly about uh, making positive wellness, wholeness choices for your body, mind, and spirit. So we're very much about promoting uh, positivity, wholeness, wellness, and avoiding all the things that uh, could get in our paths to succeed. And you're all here to succeed. So we'll be in touch. We'll be emailing you about more of our Fall Our Lead activities. We do a great safe Halloween fun thing here at Weatherford College, October 31st, and other great activities. I just wanted to say when you leave, we have tons of free giveaways, swag, stuff we all get. So help yourself, and we really appreciate you coming out today. And then I'm going to introduce with Challenge of Tarrant County. We have Cynthia here, and she's going to take her away. And thank you again for coming. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cynthia Velasquez. I'm a Challenge of Tarrant County, and we've had the pleasure of inviting Dr. Teeter. Uh, Dr. Teeter is a board-certified family physician since March of 2013. He has worked uh, as a medical advisor for the National Safety Council, addressing the, um, the national epidemic on opiate abuse, addiction, and overdose. And yesterday, we had the pleasure of having him with 825 uh, professionals over at the Hearst Conference Center. So he's done an amazing job for him. We've actually had him all over Tarrant County presenting for us. So Dr. Teeter. Thank you. Thank you. Try this microphone. Some feedback earlier. Is that okay? Can we control that somehow? It'll drive me crazy if it doesn't drive you guys crazy. That's one, two, three. That sounds better. So I, I also want to thank you all for coming here. This is a, a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. So I'm a family practice doctor and practice in a rural setting in the mountains of North Carolina since 1988. Um, most of that time was in a very small practice. I was the only doctor. My wife is a marriage and family therapist and a licensed substance abuse counselor. She was there also. So we did kind of the behavioral health and the physical health together. Um, it worked out really well. It was, it was a wonderful practice. While we were doing that, we began to see more and more people in our area becoming addicted to the prescription opioid pain medications. And actually, kind of Appalachian Mountains is where all this really started. So 12 years ago, I actually opened a clinic specifically to treat those who are addicted to, to opioids in, in, in my practice. And as I talk about opioids, you understand I'm talking about the, the Percocets, the Oxycontins, the Vicodins, uh, morphine, all those, even heroin is an opioid. Heroin is used as a pain medication in Europe. They still use it in England in particular a lot for pain medication. Uh, the United States decided it wasn't safe enough to use, so we really outlawed it, but it's just an, it's an opioid like all the rest of them are. So we started to see people getting addicted to prescription pain pills. So in, in 2004, I started treating them in my clinic, and we were overwhelmed with people that were, that were taking these medications and were addicted to them. And as I heard their stories, I realized a couple things. One was that half of them got addicted by their doctor. They had no intention to get addicted to these medications or to abuse them even. They took them as prescribed and it changed their brain in ways that it made it so they had to have them and they couldn't stop taking them. So I realized the medical profession was really at fault. And, and you know, I talk bad about opioid pain medications. I often talk bad about the medical profession. I can do that because I lived through all this. I was one of those who used to prescribe a lot of these medications. And we'll talk in a little bit about why that happened. Um, but now I realize that they're causing great harm and they're not doing a whole lot of good. So one of the problems is doctors don't get much education in how to treat pain. When you guys leave here today after this hour, you'll know more about treating pain and you'll know more about opioid medications than 99% of the doctors out there. And I can say that because we did a survey of them to see what they know, and only 1% really do what I'm telling you now. So we're trying to, to spread that education. That's part of what uh, Challenge of Tarrant County has been doing, speaking to medical groups. We're going out to a hospital after this to talk to some doctors. Um, so we're trying to spread that information. But it's near and dear to my heart, not only because I've seen people that, that became addicted but because we've had a lot of overdoses in our county. I've, I've had a number of people I've been very close to who have died of overdose. One was the chief deputy um, sheriff in our county. 
Uh, he was just a great guy. He was known to take people out of the out of the jail if they didn't have shoes and go buy them shoes and take them back. Sometimes he took them to his home to eat dinner if they looked like they were hungry. He was just a great guy. Really wanted to help people. Um, but his doctor put him on the opioid pain medications, and one night took some and had a glass of beer and didn't wake up that night. Didn't wake up the next morning. So. I, you know, I've seen a number of people, I, I, I have a lot of friends and even patients who lost very close loved ones, children in particular, who died from this. So it's, it's a real problem. So to give you a little overview of the problem, um, the United States, we have 4.6% of the world's population, yet we consume 80% of the world's opioid pain medications. So we, we use more than our share. The rest of the world gets around gets along pretty well with that. Canada also, they, they prescribe at about the same rate we do. It's just their population is much, much smaller, but they, they consume about 10%. So the whole rest of the world gets the other 10%. Because of our use, because of all the opioids that come here, 83% of, of the world's population has no access to opioid pain medications. And it's a problem. So as I mentioned, I talk bad about opioids, you know. I, I think they're greatly over-prescribed, but there are a couple times when they're very important, and one is end-of-life situations. People are dying in pain. These are the medications they should be getting, and they should be getting as many as they need uh, to help them out. Um, my son and daughter-in-law lived in Calcutta, India for three years, and they had no opioids in that area, and they had a number of their neighbors who were dying from painful cancer kind of conditions who had no access to these. It's a miserable death if you're going through pain at the end of your life. So we didn't always prescribe this many opioids. This is kind of a relatively new problem. So in, in 1997, we prescribed enough opioids for every man, woman, and child in the country to get uh, 96 milligrams of morphine equivalent. So you know, opioids have different strengths. Oxycodone is 50% stronger than, than, than uh, morphine is. But we, we converted all to kind of the morphine equivalent so we can measure them all. So back in 1997, we had enough so every man, woman, and child could get 96 milligrams of morphine. Just 10 years later, that had gone up to 700 milligrams of morphine. Currently, it's about 725. So we, our prescribing hasn't increased quite as fast, but it's still increasing. So 700 milligrams of morphine equivalent, that's enough uh, to give every man, woman, and child in the United States uh, a bottle of 140 Vicodin tablets each year. So we're prescribing a lot of these medications. So the thing is, you think if we're prescribing this many medications, we'd be doing pretty well taking care of our pain. There shouldn't be anybody in pain if we have that many opioids out there, right? But a study done a few years ago by the Institute of Medicine said, not only is there a big pain problem still in our country, but rising in prevalence means we're having more and more people suffer from pain all the time. Our, our numbers are going up. So we're not helping this problem, it's getting worse. This is a study that was in the Journal of American Medical Association a couple years ago, and it looked compared 1990 to 2010, and it compared to how many years people have lived with a, disability, with a disabling pain. And you'll notice during that time that, that the uh, pain levels went up in, in these things. Other MS is other musculoskeletal diseases, so those are really the four painful conditions that they measured. But all of them are getting worse during this time when we're prescribing more opioids. So many of the, the, the people that really want us to be prescribing so many opioids, the pain doctors that, that make their money off of using these medications in the pharmaceutical industry, wants us to believe that these medications are critical for people in pain to help reduce their pain. But in fact, we see it's not reducing, it's going up. Let me comment and say, if you guys ever have any comments or questions, feel free to interrupt me, I'm fine with that. So this shows kind of how this happened. Um, so, you know, I started practicing back in 1988, because I actually was in medical school in 1985, or finished medical school in 1985. So, you know, I, I started practice back in the times when we weren't prescribing many of these. We just didn't prescribe the Percocets. We never prescribed morphine. I mean, that stuff just never happened. Maybe a few Percocets after surgery, uh, but it just wasn't something we did. Oftentimes, people would go home from the hospital, or if they saw me for a broken ankle or a sprained ankle or something, we'd have them take ibuprofen. That was the medicine we used a lot. But in 1986, these two people, Portnoy and Foley, wrote an article. And, and these are pain doctors, and they're associated with Johns Hopkins University. And they wrote an article in the Journal of American Medical Association that said, we think we need to expand the use of opioids. We treat patients with chronic pain that don't have cancer, and we've been giving them opioid medications, and it's doing very well and that nobody's getting addicted. That was always the fear, that if you put people on them, they would get addicted. And they said that doesn't happen. And so actually, as you look closely at the article, it was only 21 patients. 
They only had them on it for a short period of time, a couple of months, and there was no follow-up after that. And usually it was while they were in the hospital, actually. So it wasn't a very good article, but it got people talking about this. And the guys <laughs> started thinking that maybe it was okay to use opioids for other kinds of pain. So it's important to understand that, that as a primary care doctor, studies have shown that 20% of the people that come into my office are coming in with pain-related uh, conditions and, and pain-related reasons. So pain is a big thing that people go to the doctor for. You know, we all really have a desire to help our patients and to treat that pain. And before we used ibuprofen, thought that was okay. Now they're saying we can use stronger medications and it's even better. So doctors are starting to listen to this. In 1996, the American Pain Society and the American Academy of Pain Medicine uh, got together and they developed guidelines for treatment of chronic non-cancer pain. And these are the first official guidelines that came out and said, yes, you should be using opioids for these conditions. That they're safe, people won't get addicted, start using as much as you need. So as this came out, we started to prescribe even more. Interestingly, as you look back now, you, we see that, that those two organizations were, of course, highly funded by the pharmaceutical industry. You know, in fact, most of their funding came from the pharmaceutical industry. They were really organizations of the pharmaceutical industry. And, and most of the people that were on the panel that came up with that with those guidelines were also themselves funded by the pharmaceutical industry. So big farmers had their fingers in this for a long time. Partially because of all that, uh, in, in the late 1990s, it became very popular to say, we're not treating pain well enough. You know, we need to do better. And the state started passing laws saying that doctors won't be punished for prescribing too many opioids to their patients. That if they're having pain, you just go as high as you need. Because before then, the, the medical boards were always kind of looking at us and making sure we weren't prescribing too much. Now the, the states are saying, the lawmakers are saying, no, you give as much as you need to, for these people to make them feel better. In fact, they said, some of the states said, if you don't prescribe enough and your patients are suffering pain, you can get in trouble for that. So this also got us thinking, well, okay, we should be prescribing more and more. And our patients that are in pain, you know, we were prescribing more. So also, really around 2000, um, the pharmaceutical industry really started uh, marketing aggressively to our, us doctors. Purdue Pharmaceuticals are really the, the real bad guys. The ones that really started this. They came out with OxyContin, and they they are the first company that direct directly advertised and marketed to doctors about how this was the important pain treatment, about using opioids for pain treatment. And they actually came to our office, and again, I remember this. I remember the rep coming in my office and saying, "These pills are completely safe if you use them for pain." If your patient has pain, they will not get addicted to them. You give them the, the starting dose. If that doesn't work, if their pain doesn't go away, you increase the dose until it does. And so we all believe this, and, and, and you know we wanted to believe this because we, we do see a lot of people in pain. We wanted to help them out. The other thing is we'll, we'll talk in a little bit about how the opioids uh, have this immediate effect where you do feel good when you first start on, right? You feel great, actually, when you first start on. So these people would come back to their first visit after we started, and they're feeling wonderful, we're the greatest doctor in the world, you know, and you know, it's a lot of positive reinforcement. Then as time goes on, it's not working so good, so we have to increase the dose, and they come back then and say, oh yeah, you're great, this is perfect, and then it happens all again. So anyway, we, we believe them. Purdue Pharmaceuticals came out with this video that, that showed seven patients, uh, and I don't, it's called Freedom from Pain or something like that, but they all talk about how their life was miserable, they were basically dead fast because of their pain, nothing was working for them. The doctor put them on OxyContin, and now they're out, you know, shows them dancing with their spouse and doing all these wonderful things. And life is great now, right? Getting back to work, doing all these great things. So, you know, again, very reinforcing to us that that's what we should be using. The uh, Milwaukee Journal did a, a, a story about that a few years ago. And they looked at these seven people to see what they're doing now. This is 15 years later. You know, what are they doing now? One of the seven people wouldn't talk to them. And of the other six, three of them had severe addiction problems. One of them had died from an overdose. One was currently abusing and, and addicted to them and was you know, using heroin and stuff. And the third one was in recovery, uh, but was struggling with that. The other three people were still doing okay. But if you figure 50% in 15 years have se severe drug problems, that's a pretty significant thing. So we started prescribing more and more. And, and again, I did that myself. You know, I gave, this, gave these to patients because I thought they were helping. I thought it was the best thing we could do. Uh, but now we know that that's not exactly true. So this is an article that was in the American Journal of Public Health a few years ago, and you see the title there. And basically, what we have found out since then is the Purdue Pharmaceuticals that, that manufacture OxyContin, they knew what they were telling us wasn't true. They knew people got addicted to it. They knew that you would have to keep going to higher and higher doses. 
but they didn't share that with us. They told us it was very safe, so they really misled us. They, well, I will say it, they lied to us. And, and so the federal government realized this, and they fined them like $600 million, right, which is a fraction of their profits in one year. So they knew all along that, you know, they made this calculated judgment. Let's go out and lie. We might get big fines, but we're going to make a lot of money off this. And they have made. So the, the, the family of, of the Purdue Pharmaceuticals is a privately held uh, company, and the family that owns it is one of the richest families in the world now. You know, behind the Walton, so I think it may be one other family. So I mentioned doctors don't know about how to treat pain. So this is a big part of the problem. So this is a study just a couple of years ago that showed that, that we get an average of nine hours of pain treatment, uh, pain education in medical school. And I don't think I got that much, um, but some schools do. And most of those hours are really divided up. Like when you do a surgery <clears throat> rotation, they just talk about what medications you should get when people go home. And, and you know, oftentimes they do kind of promote the opioids still, but it's still not very much. When you figure out how many hours students are in medical school, that comes up to like 0.01% of the time that we learn about pain. We also don't get hardly any education on addiction, and that's still a problem. 10% uh, of Americans will suffer an addiction problem sometime in their lifetime, so it's a very common problem. We get no education on it. Doctors don't like to deal with it since we don't understand it. So we just don't pay attention to it. We don't look for it. We don't try to treat it when it happens. We don't worry about it so much. But it's a big problem. So currently where I am now in Western North Carolina, I still see patients one day a week. The rest of the time I'm out traveling around. Um, but one day a week I, I see patients and I do both addiction treatment and I do some primary care there. Um, and I work with the local residency program. We have a family practice residency program near us. And they send their students out because they want them to learn about addiction. And in their three-year residency program, they spend one half day with me is all they get. So we're still not doing very good with that. And the other thing is, opioids in particular, we don't get much education on them. So we, we all have to take a pharmacology course. They address it a little bit in pharmacology, but they talk about the basic side effects, about how they stop the breathing if you take too high a dose and how people can overdose, and you have to watch out for that. But they don't talk about the addiction issue with it. And they don't talk about the other dangers. Um, they uh, don't talk about many of the side effects you guys are going to learn about in a while, so doctors don't understand them. And unfortunately, with all that little knowledge, about 40 to 60 percent of people with back pain will get an opioid prescription at some time. The American Academy of Neurology has come out and said nobody with back pain should get opioids because it makes the problem worse, and we'll talk about in a minute about why that happens. So this is a chart that was done by the, the Center for Disease Control a few years ago. And the green line is that increase in the prescribing of opioids that I talked about. More and more people are getting the opioids. The red line is the overdose deaths. The yellow line is the treatment, is the admission to treatment programs, the treatment of opioid use disorder. So you see all of them are going up in parallel. And basically what the CDC said as they came out with this graph and showed this study was that the problem that's driving this whole thing, all of the addiction, all of the overdose deaths, is the prescribing. It's because there's so many out there that's having, that this is happening. If we can reduce the number of opioids we prescribe or we utilize, then uh, these other problems will get better as well. So there's a lot of other things we do in the opioid problem. We talk about treatment for people who are addicted. That's extremely important. That's actually the other thing I talk about a lot is, is, is addiction treatment. Um, but we talk about naloxone, which is the reversal drug that reverses people having an overdose. That's important to be out there. Um, we talk about uh, doctors checking a prescription drug monitoring program to see if their patients are getting prescriptions from anybody else. That's important to do. But the key to changing this whole epidemic is to change our prescribing. And we talk about the overdose deaths, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. For every one person who dies of an overdose, there's 15 people who are admitted for treatment of addiction. There's 26 emergency uh, department visits, 115 people who are abused or are addicted to them already and 733 non-medical users. So we talked about the deaths, and, and the, the official number is 29,000 people died from an opioid overdose in 2014. We think in 2015 that number is going to increase by about 20%, so it's getting more every year. So it's a lot of people dying, but there's a whole lot of other people that are suffering because of this as well. And that doesn't even include the families of the people that are addicted and all they go through. So I, I put this slide up because much of what I do now is public health stuff, and this is kind of one of those public health stats that we look at when we look at how we're doing in America with our health care. And you see some, some diseases during this period of time, 2000 to 2010, we have fewer people dying, 
heart disease in particular is one where we're reducing mortality and, and people are living longer. There's an article, or there's a story on NPR this morning about that, about how we're doing really well with that. And, uh, you know, motor vehicle crashes, we're reducing those. But some things we're not doing so well. Suicide is going up, liver disease is going up. Much of that comes from hepatitis C from people who are using drugs IV. Um, hypertension, more people dying from complications of that. But prescription drug overdose is really the big one. So that, that's, the, that's the medical problem that's getting worse the fastest, is how many people are dying from the overdoses. So you've got kind of a, a, a big picture of the problem, uh, of, the, of the scope of the problem. Let's talk about the opioids themselves and, and, and some of the things about them. So opioids come from opium. Opium comes from the poppy plant. Right? Poppies are, are, are very pretty flowers. So I've mentioned this a few times. Do they grow those in Texas alongside of the road anywhere? Do you know? Yes. Okay. Many states do that. They grow them because they're really pretty flowers. They grow really easily. Those are a different different type of poppy, though. They don't have the opium in it because the, these poppies that have opium are illegal in the United States. But they grow them a lot in Mexico. They grow them in Afghanistan. Um, they grow some in China now. Um, so they are very pretty. And, and, and I talked to a DEA agent about six months ago. He said he'd been down to Mexico and seen whole mountainsides that are covered with poppies. He said it's beautiful. But you start thinking about how many people are going to die from those, and it's kind of scary. Um, what happens is after the, the petals fall off, you're left with this seed pod about the size of a golf ball. Workers will go through the field with a knife, they'll cut those open, and they'll squeeze out this latex-like material, and that's the opium. There's also poppy seeds in there. And the poppy seeds that you get for your food, your poppy seed muffins, comes from these poppies sometimes, and they have traces of morphine on them from the opium. That's why sometimes if you had a poppy seed muffin, historically you would, might test positive for morphine if you had a drug test. They've changed that limit on the drug test so it won't pick up the poppy seed morphine because it's very low dose. <laughs> but that, six or seven years ago, that was a real problem. People would eat a poppy seed muffin, go for their drug test, and they test positive for morphine, and they'd have a hard time explaining that. But anyway, they separated out the seeds and they had this latex, and historically what they would do is just lay it in the sun and let it dry out. And it became a white powder called opium. It was, it was opium. Uh, and it was used different ways. They've been using it for thousands of years. The Sumerians wrote about, right, wrote about using it like 3000 BC, so it's been used for a long time. Hippocrates wrote about using opium for treatment of both depression and pain. So it's probably one of our oldest medicines that we've used. There have been wars, you've heard of the opium wars between England and China that were fought in the mid-1800s because of, of poppies and opium. Um, so it, it's been an important product for us. The opium powder itself, it contains 80% morphine. 80% of it is morphine. 15% of it is codeine. So those are the two major opi opiate medications. The ones that come directly from opium are uh, morphine and codeine. The third chemical, the 5% of it is one called thebane. We don't use that for pain treatment, but we use it to make other medications like oxycodone. It comes from thebane. So it's also important to understand pain. So as we're thinking about this whole issue, you know, pain is obviously involved, the opioids are involved, um, there's a number of things involved, uh, kind of our whole social system is involved, but we won't get into that so much. But to understand pain, this is one thing that doctors don't understand. Again, we're, 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 we treat it a lot and we address it a lot, but we don't understand it because we didn't get much education. So this definition comes from the International Association for the Treatment of Pain, and it's very similar. There's a number of other pain societies that have very similar uh, definitions. But the important thing to notice is that it's both a sensory and an emotional experience. Right? So oftentimes when we think of pain, we just think of the physical hurting part of it. But there's an emotional component to it also. And sometimes that can be really significant. And it's important to understand that because the opioid pain medications, they don't address the physical aspect so much as they do the emotional aspect. And the problem with that is, is the people that have more of an emotional response tend to be the ones that are more likely to become addicted. So the ones who would benefit the most from these are probably the most at risk. So the other thing to understand is there's really two types of pain, acute pain and chronic pain. Now acute pain lasts less than three months, and we know where the pain's coming from. There's some type of injury, there's some type of tissue damage, there's been surgery or something. We know where the pain is coming from. It makes sense that people are having this pain. We can explain it. We expect that as the tissue heals up, as the damage heals up, the pain will go away. Um, it, always lasts less than three months because the healing happens during that time and, and usually 90% of the time happens in less than one month and people get better. Chronic pain is completely different. For most cases of chronic pain, we don't really know where the pain's coming from. 
people with back pain, you know, they'll have an MRI, usually they'll show the doctor and it shows all these disc problems and stuff. Everybody has a bad back by looking at an MRI once they're 40 years old. Our, our back, our spine just ages by developing arthritis, the discs kind of slip out. All of that is kind of normal aging. So most people have back pain, even though they have a bad MRI, we don't know for sure where that pain is coming from. There's occasionally, if it's pinching on a nerve and they have sciatica, or when they have very specific nerve symptoms and it's a very specific pattern on their leg, we can say, oh, there's a pinched nerve, that's what's causing it. But for the great majority of people, it just hurts back there. You know, the muscles are kind of tightened up and we don't know for sure what causes it. Same thing with headaches. You know, we talk about migraine headaches, we can describe their character and what brings them on, but we don't actually really know what's causing it and what the deal is. Most other chronic headaches, we don't know for sure what's causing it. Fibromyalgia, we can describe it, but we don't know what's causing it. So chronic pain, we oftentimes don't know the exact source of the pain, which makes it harder to treat oftentimes. The other thing is, it has much more of an emotional complement than it does a physical complement. So um, I think this slide shows some of that. So this slide really shows with the acute pain how the tissue pain, the, the acute injury part is, is a major part of the pain. Thoughts and emotions play a little bit into that. You know, if you're in a really bad mood or if you're really upset about something, you, sent, you tend to feel the pain more. Otherwise, if you're distracted because you're playing in a sport of some kind, you don't feel it as much. Chronic pain is much different in that the thoughts and the emotions play a, play a much bigger role in, in the suffering that comes from that pain. And the tissue input is much mild, is much more minor. So again, there, there are really two different types of pain. <coughs> So when we look at, at, at pain treatment, there's several things we use. Acetaminophen, we'll talk about, that's called Tylenol. In Europe, they call it paracetamol, um, but it's, it's basically the Tylenol. NSAID medications are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. And those are like ibuprofen and naproxen are the over-the-counter forms of it, but there's a number of other prescription ones. There's the opioid pain medications. There's a number of topical agents um, that you can rub on there. Some of those are prescription, some are not. Many of them contain NSAID type medications. So like Bengay has an aspirin type of thing in it. But some of them are also just, they generate heat or they generate cooling, both of which really reduces some of the pain effect. And then there's non-pharmacologic things like physical therapy, ice, heat, and stuff like that that we can do. So the thing, what we're finding is that many doctors, when they prescribe pain medications, they're thinking about the side effects first. And so oftentimes the side effects is what prevents them from, from prescribing some of these medications and, and steers them towards others. And in particular with acetaminophen and the NSAIDs, acetaminophen can cause liver damage, right? And, and that's, that's the main thing that docs worry about. Taking in low doses is not a problem, but if people take high doses, it can really happen. And you know, I've seen people die from acute overdoses of Tylenol. They take a you know, whole handful of Tylenol and just shuts their liver down. It can affect mood a little bit, we think. This is kind of new. Uh, it appears to be a very mild effect, but it might cause a little bit of depression or at least kind of makes it so people don't care so much about things if they take it on a chronic basis. And it probably can cause some stomach ulcers. It doesn't happen very often. We don't even think about that here in the United States. We think it's very safe usually, but in Europe they consider acetaminophen an NSAID medication because of the GI risk of, of ulcer. The NSAIDs, they, they cause several things. One is the GI thing, they definitely cause ulcers. That's really what we worry about in these medications. Uh, renal is the kidney effects they have. They can damage kidneys, especially when taken for a long term and higher doses. So that's what prevents doctors from oftentimes using these in, in elderly people, because as we age, our kidneys don't work as well, and we need to kind of protect those. Whoops, let me go back I'm going two at a time. And I can't stop that, okay. Um, then there's the cardiac effect. We, we, we learned about 20 years ago that these medications actually increase your risk of heart attack. Uh, some more than others. The naproxen, probably not at all. The ibuprofen, a little bit. Many of the prescription ones that do more so. And several of them that were out, like uh, Bextra, that was available in the past, we had them available for a few years and realized they were causing just too many heart attacks and they were taken off the market. So because of these side effects, actually the American Geriatric Society has a chronic pain guideline for treatment of elderly people. Say because of these effects on the elderly, they recommend we don't use either of these medications. They recommend we use opioid medications for elderly people with pain, which is one of my pet peeves, actually. So the, the thing with the opioids is, again, most doctors think they're very safe. They think that it's not going to be a problem for their patient. They don't worry about the addiction issue because they know their patient is fine. And, and they think they're very safe. So many times opioids are prescribed because they're felt to be safer. But in fact, they have a number of side effects. One is they clearly are mentally impairing. So if you're taking an opioid, you shouldn't be driving. 
right? You shouldn't be working in a job that, that is what we call a safety sensitive job where you know you have to be really sharp and, and think sharply. So they are mentally impairing. One of the big things they do is they affect what we call divided attention. So, and it's kind of interesting because people don't appear to be impaired while they're taking the opioids. That's one of the people, one of the reasons young people like to take them sometimes. They can come home and their parents won't know because they don't appear to be impaired. They're not stumbling or anything. But it affects what we call divided attention. And divided attention is our ability to, to think from one subject to the other, to change between subjects. So we really can't multitask in our brain. Our brain thinks of one thing at a time. But when we're trying to do two, two or three things at a time, it's jumping from one to the other real fast. So even like driving on the road and talking on a cell phone, you're thinking for a minute to who you're talking to, then you're paying attention, you're going back and forth. The, these, what these do is make it so you can't switch back and forth between subjects so fast. So people can drive, and as long as it, they're just concentrating and they're driving and nothing happens, that's fine. The kid runs out in front of them, they're not going to be able to change fast enough to think, oh, I need to steer out of the way and, and avoid this accident or avoid this child. So that's one of the, one of the things they do. They delay recovery. So doctors don't understand this either. Very commonly, if you have orthopedic surgery, I pick on the orthopedic doctors because they do this a lot. They will give you an opioid pain medication for a whole week or two weeks at a time and say, take this continuously after your surgery to reduce the pain so it'll increase your rehabilitation so you can get up and get around and do your exercises, right? But studies have shown that just that doesn't happen. The more opioids people get after surgery, the longer it takes them to get better. There's actually a whole movement going on now in our country called Enhanced Recovery After Surgery where they do major surgery, and this can be either abdominal surgery or orthopedic surgery, and they try not to use any opioids, either IV or PO afterwards. And these people get out of the hospital days sooner than those people that got opioids, and they have less complications. They increase medical costs partially because they delay recovery, and they cause something called op opioid hyperalgesia. And doctors don't know about this either. So we surveyed doctors, and it's like 5% were familiar with phenomenon. Hyperalgesia means increased pain. So they actually make you more sensitive to pain. So the acetaminophen and the NSAID medications, they work by reducing pain by addressing where the pain is. They reduce the chemicals and the inflammatory properties and stuff that's going on wherever the injury is. But the opioids work in the brain. Our brain is smart enough to realize that we're supposed to feel pain. It's a defense mechanism for us. So people that don't feel pain, two of, two of the classic examples, one is people with diabetes when their nerves and their legs go bad and they can't feel their feet. And the problem with that is they'll get a sore on the bottom of their foot. They don't know it, they don't pay attention to it, it gets infected. And that's the main reason why people with diabetes will have a foot or a leg amputated because they get infected and they didn't pay any attention to it. People with leprosy, you've seen pictures of them, they're missing fingers and they're on a hand or something. Same thing, leprosy affects the nerves, they don't feel pain. And because of that they don't pay as much attention to their injuries and they end up losing their fingers or their hands or their arms or whatever. So we're supposed to feel pain. It's important for us to understand when something's hurting. Our brain knows that. We take an opioid, which goes to our brain, and starts to dull that feeling. And right away our brain thinks, oh, you know, something's happening here. We need to feel this. So it makes changes in the brain so that you're more sensitive to the pain the next time. And they've done studies on this. It's kind of a cool study that they'll do. They'll have people put their hand down in the bucket of ice water and see how long they can leave it in there until they can't stand it anymore and they pull it out and they time that. Then they'll give them a shot of morphine, they'll wait till it wears off and they'll have them do it again. And the time they can keep it in, in the bucket is reduced by like 30% because now they're more sensitive to pain. And what we see, we've seen this in, in surgery, so it used to be common, they did back surgery, that before the patient woke up they'd give them a shot of fentanyl uh, so that when they woke up they wouldn't be feeling it. But they did a study comparing those who got fentanyl while they were asleep compared to those who didn't. And the ones who didn't were, had, ended up having less pain after they woke up. So the ones that they got it, you know, in the recovery room, they seemed to be doing pretty well. You know, it seems like this works. But when they got out on the floor, they were needing more and more pain medications because now they were more sensitive. So that's a real problem. We think that's one of the reasons why uh, people with back pain in particular shouldn't be on opioids because the back pain tends to be chronic. It helps initially when they're taking it, but then as, as their body gets used to it, they feel the pain more, and when, particularly when they try to stop the pills, they feel it worse than it was before, and they just can't get off of it. Studies, workers' comp studies, show people injured on the work site. They, they're able to follow them really closely, and they found that people that were injured in the workplace that got a prescription for an opioid within six weeks of their injury had double the rate of disability one year later. And again, the thought is a lot of that is that opioid hyperalgesia making them more sensitive to their pain and de delaying the recovery and leading to disability. <laughs> We have more people getting on disability now than any time in our country, and mostly for pain-related conditions, some for mental health stuff, but mostly for pain.
and we think our opioid use is part of, is part of what's driving that. In the elderly, they increase the risk of falls by a factor of four. They're four times more likely to fall. So I had one patient years ago who actually came from the next town over to come and see me. I, I do a lot of work with people in, in the mental health system, and, and she was brought over by her social worker. And she wanted me to work with her. Well, this lady was on chronic opioids, and her problem was she kept falling. And she'd go to the emergency room with a broken bone and stuff. I said, you know, we get to take you off these pills. And she said, no, I have to stay on these because I'm hurting all the time. I said, well, they're causing you to fall. And she says, I don't care. I have to stay on because I'm hurting all the time. So she ended up finding another doctor. That's one of the drawbacks of trying to get people better. So they do increase the risk of falls. So I talked the other day at a children's hospital, and after I was done, one of the social workers came up to me, or one of the quality insurance people came up to me and said, you know, it's not just in the elderly. She said, you know, anytime one of our children falls in the hospital, we make a report and try to find out what's going on, and we're finding that the leading cause of falls of children in our hospital is having opioids. They got an opioid dose soon before they got up. A number of recent studies show, particularly in the elderly, these actually increase your risk of heart attack by 50% and increase your risk of a stomach bleed by 50%. So that's something most doctors don't know either. And there's a number of reasons why that happens. They treat depression. So I have this as a complication. You think it's good, but it's not. Um, they're wonderful at treating depression. So people that have been depressed all their life, and, and I put this up there in particular because a lot of my patients tell me this. When they come in for addiction treatment, they'll tell me, they said, I was depressed all my life, I've been on Prozac, Paxil, and all these medications, and they all worked just a little bit, but I was just always depressed, nothing made me happy, nothing was fun, and I sprained my ankle, and I took a Percocet the doctor gave me, and suddenly, within 15 minutes, my depression is completely gone. So there have been studies that show that the opioids work immediately on depression and get rid of it. The problem is the effect doesn't last very long. It starts to wear off faster than the pain relieving effects do. So people, they get that prescription for purpose that they start taking and, you know, first every four hours and every three hours and every two hours to keep that effect going. And then they find that if they try to stop, the depression is worse than it was before. So there's kind of this rebound. And then after just a few months, it doesn't work at all for the depression and they're just trying to take the pills just to feel like they did before. Uh, and they're not working. And then pretty soon, ultimately, in the long run, people on chronic opioid therapy have twice the depression rate as other people. So it, it starts out by treating the depression, but then the depression there's actually some, buprenorphine is one of the drugs we use to treat people that are addicted. And it's an opioid type of medication. But it works a little differently from all the others. And it works kind of a special way in the brain where uh, you don't develop a tolerance to it. So you can you know, get on a low dose of it sometimes. It works very well. And they're using that to treat depression in some people where nothing else works. And it's, it's pretty remarkable how well, how well that works. They cause brain changes. So I mentioned how your brain starts to change after that first dose to make you more sensitive. Those changes continue. And the longer you take the opioid, the more these changes uh, occur. And the changes are such that they make it so you want the opioid more, and you want to do other things less, so they become more and more a focus of your attention. There's a doctor, Dr. Younger, who had patients with back pain a couple of years ago. And as they came in, he, he took 100 of them and put them on morphine four times a day. He took 100 of them and put them on ibuprofen four times a day. He did an MRI of their brains before they started. He gave them all treatment for a month and had them come back and repeated the MRI. And one month later, the MRI on those that were on the morphine had changed enough. He could see changes on the MRI, which means that billions of cells have changed by that point. So he thought, oh man, you know, we're, we're causing damage to these people's brains. We've got to take them off right away. So he took them off right away, put them all on ibuprofen, had them come back six months later, and his brain changes were still there. They didn't get back to normal. So his conclusion is the changes that are occurring from the opioids are probably permanent. These are permanent brain changes that are and obviously they cause addiction as we're seeing in our country. So, you know, we have a lot of addicting substances out there. Um, and, and I do addictions treatment I, and I work with all kinds of addictions, but, but opioids are kind of special. And one reason is we do see such a growing number of people becoming addicted and overdosing from them. But also because they're a little bit different. So dopamine is, is, is the thing that, that all addicting substances have in common. Anything that's addicting stimulates <coughs> dopamine in your brain. That's your feel-good chemical in your brain. But opioids also um, stimulate that opioid receptor, and that's different. Now, alcohol actually does a little bit, but nothing like the opioids do. And we'll talk in a minute about the opioid receptor and why that's, why that's special. So you can't see that picture very well. That's a dopamine molecule hanging from my wife's ear. <laughs> 
So again, dopamine is that feel-good molecule. It's, it's, it's the thing that surges in our brain when we have a good meal with family, when our football team wins the big game, we're watching, you know, that wonderful feeling you have when you're with your friends and you're just having a great time. That's dopamine. Um, so dopamine, again, it's the one that, that all addictive <coughs> drugs stimulate. Gabapentin is a drug that people are starting to abuse a little bit nowadays, but we're, we don't think it's a physically addicting because it doesn't actually stimulate, stimulate the dopamine. But opioids do, they stimulate that a lot. But I mentioned the other thing they do is they stimulate those opioid receptors. And so this is another thing that the medical profession doesn't understand very well. I asked them, I'll, I'll give talks, I said, do you know what the opioid receptor does? And they all think it's to relieve pain, but that's not what it is. They help us achieve a goal. That's why God gave us these. And they do that in several ways. And, and, and so as I talk about this, it's kind of a, a thing you can think about as runners. You hear about them talk about, you know, their, the endorphin surge they have or the runner's high they feel. That's the endorphins, which are the opioid-like chemicals already in your brain, attaching to their opioid receptor. So, and it helps them achieve that short-term goal. So you hear marathon runners, they'll say the last six miles are horrible, but the last two miles are not bad at all because suddenly I have this increased energy, this increased motivation. That's their endorphin surging. So they do it several ways. They do decrease pain, but that's really a minimal effect. We'll talk about that in a minute. But they increase motivation. That's a big one, right? They make you think, I can do this, I can make it, I can achieve whatever I'm trying to do, uh, and they give you that increased motivation. They also increase your confidence that, that you're going to reach that goal. So, you know, it makes it less likely you're going to give up, right? You're going to go even stronger for it. They do stimulate the dopamine, so they increase that reward, just make you feel better about it all. They reduce depression and, and anxiety as well. They increase the pleasure in whatever you're doing, and part of that's kind of through that dopamine effect. Oops. And they do something we call, they, 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 they um, cause this, this feeling, or they increase this, what, they, what this uh, scientists call warmth liking. And I'm just kind of learning about this. I just read about it six or seven months ago or so. But it's really interesting. It's how we like warm things. So it's like you get up on a cold morning and take a warm shower. Or you've been out in the cold all day, you get in, you get in a, you know, under a warm blanket. Or you sit next to a fire or something. It's that you hold a cup, hot cup of, of coffee and you're sipping on your coffee. It's liking warm things. It's also a similar reaction that occurs with love. And it's a similar reaction with interpersonal bonding. When you're with your friends and having a, you know, a great time, and you have kind of this warm fellowship, togetherness kind of feeling. That's all your opioid receptor doing that. So there... I've heard this from some of my patients, but I heard it to even a, a kind of a more significant degree on the radio the other day. Um, they were interviewing a girl on, on a local radio station who had been addicted, and they said, so tell us, why did you start taking opioids? What did what, what you feel like when you first started on it? And she said, it felt like a hug from God. And so I hear that from my patients also. Not so much that term, but they'll say, I just felt like a, like a hug. Like, you know, somebody, somebody was hugging me, and, and I felt content and happy. So that's that warmth light. So you all know the story of the Wizard of Oz, and, and I use this because it, 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 it's a great example of our opioid receptors. Dorothy and her friends have been in the woods for a long time. All these bad things have been happening to them. You know, it's a dark, scary place, and suddenly they come out and they see this beautiful field of poppies. Obviously, the poppies have a in them. But you think of their initial reaction. You know, right away they go from being sad and depressed to being happy and excited. They have energy. They are singing, they're dancing, they're skipping, they have this increased motivation and confidence. They link arms, they got this feeling of togetherness, they're skipping down the yellow brick road. That's the opioid receptor. All those thoughts and all those that whole response is, is flooding of the opioid receptor by the opioid. So Frank Baum wrote this book in the late 1800s. I don't know how he knew that, but he kind of knew what opium does to you. So you remember as the story goes on, Dorothy and Toto and the cowardly lion get tired and fall asleep, right? So. Again, that's what I hear from my patients. Initially, it's great, but then it kind of wears you out and you get so you can't function anymore. You notice the Tin Man and, and the Scarecrow don't, because they, they're not mammals. They don't have opioid receptors in their brain. It doesn't affect them. So Dorothy and, her friend, and, and two of them fall asleep. Do you remember how they wake up? Glenda the Good Witch sends snow. It snows on them, wakes them up. So back when the book was written, just like today, snow was a nickname for cocaine. So back in the late 1800s when he wrote this book, in the late 1800s when he wrote this book, uh, opium was very common. Opium had really been brought to the United States by the Chinese in the mid-1800s mid when they came over to work building our trains and, and our, and our uh, railroad lines. 
and they brought opium with them. So opium was becoming popular. There were opium dens. People would go smoke opium. The morphine and, and heroin were also available. And so, and, uh, and so they would use these chemicals, and if they used too much, and they had to go home or go to work or somehow function, they would snort cocaine to wake themselves up. And my patients today tell me that same story. You know, they're doing whatever their pills are, and if they take too much, they'll snort some cocaine if they need to go to work or go to school. So many times when they come into me that very first visit, we do a drug test, and the drug test will be positive for the opium and it'll be or the opioid medication, and it'll be positive for cocaine. Sometimes methamphetamine they use, but more commonly it's cocaine. So that's the Dorothy reaction. I do that so people remember what the opioid receptor does. And you know, I just hear that so many times from my patients. They'll say, you know, life is so bad, life is so rough, you know. I, I never did well in school, I struggled in school, my dad abused me, you know, I got married, my spouse abuses me, I work at a minimum wage job, my job, my boss hates me, life is miserable, and I take one of these pills and suddenly, you know, life is good. Life is wonderful. So in particular for some of you guys, there will be use on campus, 16% of students say they've used pain pills non-medically in their lifetime. Higher, it's higher for uh, athletes. That was a study recently done by the Hazel Medi Ford Institute. And this study was done on, on, on kids under the age of, of uh, 21. But it really, we know from the way the brain works that, that, that this probably occurs to anyone up to the age of 26. And that's this study showed that if you get one prescription for an opioid, uh, it increases your risk of future abuse and addiction by 30%. So somehow, in the developing brain up to age 26, you're more susceptible to these and what they do, and more susceptible to developing so one of my pet peeves also is that dentists prescribe these a lot to folks under the age of 21. They're the largest prescribers, actually, when other medications would probably work better. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but just, you know, for you guys to know, probably any of you under the age of 26, that's an issue you need to think about. They, they sort of prime your brain for this later drug use. Well, let me also mention it. An interesting thing they found was that those that had no risk factors, those that had no family history of addiction, had you know, lived a good life, everything was fine, it increased their risk of future addiction by a factor of three. They were three times more likely, so 300% more likely. Pretty significant. So, you know, the, the opioid abuse problem affects everybody, all, all ages, all um, socioeconomic groups. Um, but young folks have some particular risks involved. And one is that opioids relieve stress. And, you know, I've lived through a long period of time in my youth and, and young adult period is the most stressful. I mean, you know, you're trying to develop your, your friends and find your place in the, the whole social strata. And you're trying to decide what job you're going to do in the future. You're going to school. You're trying to achieve there. Um, you have all these pressures on you. You know, these opioids reduce that stress. So that's one reason why young people are at risk. Whoops, they, it, it increases your motivation. So whatever you're trying to do, in school in particular, you need to feel like you can do it more, which puts you at risk of addiction. It may help you concentrate more. If taken in low dose, higher doses, that doesn't work. Again, the divided attention doesn't work so well, but if you're concentrating on one thing, it might help with that. They do treat anxiety and depression, which is very common in young folks these days. And I mentioned earlier that there's no obvious impairment for it. So, again, in particular, high school kids, you know, they're out partying. If they're going home and their parents are going to be awake, that's, that's a drug they like to do. And athletes probably more likely to be prescribed opioids and more susceptible to their effects because they have more of a sense of, of, of what they're trying to achieve. In particular, if they want to think that their athletics will be their, their future income. So I also want to say that, that opioids alone are problematic enough, but taken with other drugs, they can be even worse. In particular, are the benzodiazepines, the Ativan, the Xanax, the Clonopens. You can take very low doses of the opioids, and if you're already on the benzodiazepines, if you take one along with it, your overdose risk is very high. That, that's what many people die of, is they take the opioids and the benzodiazepines together. Alcohol probably also slightly increases your risk, um, just because it's sedating, just like the opioids are. So if you take the opioids in a higher dose along with alcohol, that can be a problem. I mentioned earlier my friend who died uh, after he drank a beer on his prescription of opioids. The stimulants probably have little additional effect with the opioids, or with the opioids, they don't have much effect. You know, again, I mentioned the cocaine and methamphetamine is commonly used with to kind of wake people back up, which I say there. 
So if the opioids are not good medicines, if they have so many side effects, if they're so risky, what do we do for pain? Well, these are some studies that were done by an organization called the Cochrane Organization. And Cochrane is the major organization in the world that looks at, at medical treatments and what works and what doesn't work. So they look at all the studies that have been done on a particular subject, and they put them all together, and they say, okay, so this drug probably works better than this one. This one doesn't work so good. It's a nonprofit organization out of England. So they looked at, at how these different medications reduce pain, and their goal is 50% reduction in pain. So if it reduces, it, and they're all done post-operative uh, cases, so people, most of them had orthopedic surgery, and they come into the recovery room and they say, what's your pain? And the person would say, eight. They give them one of these pills. If it takes it to a four, then that's successful treatment. That's good. If it takes it to five, it's not. So they looked at how successful these different treatments are. And the first one, one of them they looked at here was this 200 milligrams of ibuprofen. That's one over-the-counter ibuprofen pill. And they found that 37% of pain, people had 50% pain relief. So that's not too bad, actually, for a pain medication. They looked at 500 milligrams of acetaminophen. That's one extra strength Tylenol. And they found that 28% of people had half their pain relieved. Again, not really too bad. If so Tylenol is your only option, you know, one. And, and two of them is, is better. It's up around 35%. Um, but Tylenol works OK. They looked at 400 milligrams of ibuprofen, so double the dose. But the, the percentage only went up a few points. So the point here is really that low, low dose ibuprofen works as well as the high dose ibuprofen. The higher dose ibuprofen is the one that has the side effects of the stomach ulcers and the kidney damage. Lower dose is the 200 milligrams taken six times a day has no side effects. Doesn't affect your kidney, doesn't affect your stomach. So when I talk to people about uh, doing pain treatment, I, I always recommend the lower dose. The oxycodone 15 milligrams, that's a pretty strong dose of oxycodone. Most doctors wouldn't give that right away post-op, but they looked at that to see how much that works and only 21% of people had adequate pain relief. So the, the pharmaceutical industry knew, knows this, so they combined it. They combined the oxycodone with acetaminophen, and that's Percocet, Tylox, a number of others. And so this strength here, 10 milligrams of oxycodone and 1,000 of acetaminophen, is roughly the equivalent of two 5 milligram Percocets taken together. And only 37% of people had their pain relief with that. So no different from one over-the-counter ibuprofen and yet commonly used post-operatively here for acute trauma. So one thing they do in Europe that we don't do here so much, but we're trying to change this, is using one over-the-counter ibuprofen, 200 milligrams, with one extra strength Tylenol, the 500 milligrams, and 62% of people get the pain relief. And I, I urge you to try this. It really works. It's remarkable how these two drugs work together to relieve pain. It, it does just a great job. So I had a doctor heard me talk about this a couple of years ago. He's an orthopedic surgeon, and actually another one, his partner, interestingly, is a maxillofacial surgeon, so he does a lot of face stuff. And they decided to start using this post-operatively for pain relief. And all their patients, no matter what kind of surgery they have, they put them on a scheduled dose of the 200 milligrams and the 500 milligrams. And then while they're in the hospital, they say, you know, if the pain is just severe and the person can't take it, then they can take one Percocet. And when they send them home, they give them a prescription for like 10 Percocet. They say, only take these if you have to, but when you come back in next week to see me, bring in all you have left over because you won't need any more and we'll dispose of them. And so by doing that, they reduce their opioid use by 80% by, by using this, this protocol. So when I was at the National Safety Council, we did a survey of doctors. And, and these, the blue lines are these numbers showing how efficacious these medications are <coughs> and how good they work. And, and we've got a few other ones in here. Um, this is Tylenol number three, you see it's really not very good. And we asked doctors to, to rate them, we didn't tell them how efficacious they are, how well they work. We said, we just gave them the names and said, tell us how, you know, rank these in order of what you think is the strongest pain medication. And so they ranked morphine first. And as you see, morphine's about the same as one over the counter ibuprofen. But they ranked it as the best, and then they ranked the 15 milligrams of oxycodone as the next best. And so here, the strongest dose, again, only 1% of our of the survey people knew that that was the strongest pain medication. That's why I tell you, you guys now know more than 99% of your doctors. So we're trying to improve that. That's what I'm working on. So the, the Center for Disease Control recently came out with some guidelines on treatment of pain, uh, in particular use of opioids in treatment of pain. And, and I was actually able to be a part of that and, 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 and help work with them on, on development of that. And it's kind of, kind of fun because we had experts from all over the world talking about how to treat pain. But the, the guideline was actually for treatment of chronic pain. But as we talked about it, the, the discussion actually came around to the fact that most people with chronic pain 
uh, are on opioids because they got them for acute pain, which they shouldn't have gotten them in the first place. So they wanted to, they decided to make some make a recommendation for acute pain, and the recommendation was, you know, first of all, try not to use them at all for acute pain, but if people have to have them, give them for only three days or less. And if, if there's some extraordinary circumstance, go for seven days, but never go more than seven days. And so we asked doctors, how long do you normally give a prescription for an acute pain problem? And as you can see, only 1% did three days or less. And a total of 30% did uh, seven days or less. What's really disturbing is almost a quarter of them give them a month or more of opioids. And those are the people that you know, give 90 Percocets after you sprain your ankle or something. So we're trying to change all that also. How are we doing on time? We're running out, so I'll kind of break through this. This just says a lot of people get opioids when they shouldn't. This talks about chronic pain, um, and you know, six million people are on opioids for chronic pain. There's never been a study showing that opioids are effective for chronic pain. You know, we've got no evidence that works, and yet we keep doing it despite the fact that everybody's dying. There's a big push now. A lot of uh, educational things talk about safe and effective use, but there's no evidence that they can be safe in any dose. In fact, all the studies show that even one pill a day increases your risk of, of early death. And there's no evidence that they can be used effectively, that they have any benefit in long-term use. So I'll kind of go with that. Oh, I'll just mention college students should never be on, on chronic opioids for pain. When I talked to, at Cook Children's Hospital, they, they've got a, a doctor there that has a chronic pain clinic for children, one of only 22 in the whole country. So I mean, it's kind of a big deal. And she said, mostly what we do is we get referrals of, of kids with chronic pain on opioids, and the first thing we do is take them off, because none of them should be on chronic opioids. And their pain gets better. So I mentioned that, that half the people that get addicted got addicted because of the doctor. Some people just have a genetic predisposition to this. They take one of these pills and it really kind of locks into their brain and they have to have them. Adverse childhood events, kids that have had a rough childhood are at higher risk of, of becoming addicted. Any mental health diagnosis because it helps with that. You know, again, I mentioned the, the depression and the anxiety in particular, but also bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, it, it, it helps their brain work a little better. Anybody with stress, like, again, I mentioned this, that, that college and high school students are pretty susceptible to that. Anybody with prolonged exposure. So again, a number of my patients, their doctor had them on it for three months and then take them off and they can't get off. So I do want to say that because of the brain changes, it's important to think of addiction as, as a physical disease and not a moral failing. These people that get addicted, their brain changes and it just doesn't work right. They can't think rationally about avoiding the medication and, and it's just, it's, it's almost impossible for them just to stop on their own. So there are several treatments available, detox and abstinence, where they go through the detox process and let it come out of your body. It's extremely miserable. These people are like they have the flu, their body aches all over, they have the sweats, they, they, they shake, they, they can't sit still, they're crying, they have stomach cramps and diarrhea. It's a miserable thing. But even worse than that is they have this real fear that they're going to die. And the fear is what they remember. So after they've gone through a detox one time, they're afraid to go through it again. And that, so if they go through detox and they get an abstinence-based program where they're not on any medication, 90% of them will start using it again. Because even after the physical detox, their brain still is not working well. They have more depression than they normally would. They have more anxiety. Their brain craves these medications. Life is miserable. Their opioid receptors aren't working. They don't come back and work. So they have like the opposite of the Dorothy reaction. And so then they take one pill and it fixes all that and they start using it again. So it's not a very successful thing. In fact. People that go through this, their, their risk of overdose death increases by a factor of four after they go through that because they start using usually a higher dose. Methadone is, is medication replacement. It's an opioid type medication. It gets in there and replaces some of the chemicals and problems that are in the brain. It's very effective. Methadone is a very dangerous medicine. I've run a methadone clinic for years. Uh, you know, it completely changes lives. People are great on this. It doesn't make them high. It doesn't make them drowsy. Uh, it, doesn't, it keeps them from craving the medications. If they take something, they don't feel it because the methadone is already on all those opioid receptors. Uh, so it's very effective uh, and it's great, but it's a very dangerous medicine. So once a year, we have one of our patients die because the doctor gives them an antibiotic that interacts with it. And, and you know, they didn't know that and they take the antibiotic and they're dead the next morning. So it's very dangerous, but it does save lives. Studies have shown that people with opioid use disorder who get on this, their risk of dying decreases by 50%. So it's pretty significant. Buprenorphine is also Suboxone. That's much safer than methadone. That should be the treatment of choice for most people. It's also replacement therapy. It's a type of opioid pain medication. But it's much safer. It has what we call a ceiling effect, meaning any more than two pills a day has no effects. It's almost impossible to overdose on it. Very safe medication and also very effective. Now, Trexone is an injection. It's not an opioid. It doesn't have any opioid effects, but it gets on those opioid receptors and blocks them. So if they do take something, they don't feel it. 
So the advantage is that, that it's not impairing, it's not an opioid, so airline pilots can do it if they're trying to get past sort of addiction. Doctors can do it. You know, anybody in a high level job that has to be really sharp can do it. The problem is, is that it's blocking those opioid receptors that are necessary for our body, right? That are necessary for us to achieve things. So these people don't have much motivation, they're not excited about things, they're not good family members because they don't care what their family's doing. Uh, and so most people don't like being on that and it has a pretty high failure rate also. People start on it. It's a monthly injection. It costs $1,500 a month. So they're going for their first shot, and then maybe their second shot, and then they just don't show up after that. So I just want to say, you know, people still think of, of, of addiction as a moral failing, but it really is a disease. Uh, so I compare it to diabetes. They're both chronic diseases. They're both because of structural and chemical effects in the body, changes that have occurred. Um, they're both caused by a combination of lifestyle factors, but also genetics. Most people need medication for both diabetes and for, for the opioid use disorder if they're going to be successful. And there's no cure for either one. So our, our goal is to control the diet, the disease, not to cure it. So many people that get on the medication assisted treatment like methadone or like the buprenorphine, they want to get off sometime. But you know, they still have the disease. So as they come off, they have a relapse of their disease. And so the goal is really to, uh, to control the disease and prevent like, relapse. And, and addiction is really the only disease we have when, when there is a lack of control, we put people in jail. Right? They get arrested and they get in jail. Um, if diabetes and sugar goes up, we don't penalize people for that. So we need to figure out better how to address that. So I, I mentioned that, that opioids are useful end of life. You know, that's one time they definitely need to be given. They've also been shown in acute trauma to, um, to be helpful. Um, Studies on our soldiers in the battlefield in Afghanistan and Iraq showed that with a severe battlefield injury, the sooner they got the morphine, the less likely they were to suffer PTSD later on. And we think that's because of the immediate calming effect that it gives them. And it keeps that image of that injury and that blast or whatever it was from searing in their brain so they don't relive those memories so much. So, you know, acute severe trauma for a short time is very effective. And just say a number of treatment strategies again. I talk about decreased prescribing, but we need to make it treatment available for people that have addiction and, and recent studies show that we only have about 20% capacity to treat those that are addicted in the United States. Many We've got waiting lists where I am for people to get into treatment. We need to make it so people can easily get treated by anybody, by any doctor. Raising community awareness, that's why we're here. Naloxone is the reversal drug. It should be all over the place. Naloxone is very safe. It doesn't have any side effects. All it does is reverse overdoses. So you think about EpiPens. Everyone knows someone who has an EpiPen. Does anyone in here have one? Oftentimes, a hand will go up when I say that. EpiPens are all over the place. We have 50 people that die every year from an allergic reaction, and we have 29,000 people that die every year from an overdose. So we should have so many more uh, naloxone kits available for people to use. We need to support those who are in recovery, who have been addicted and suffering for that, because many of them have criminal records. It's hard for them to get jobs. You know, there's a stigma against addiction, uh, so we really need to support them. And I'll end by saying that 250,000 is the number of people that have died the last 20 years from opioid overdoses. That's four times the number of people that died in, in the Vietnam War, four times the number of Americans. It's an epidemic, and when I say we are the vector, I mean the medical community, right? I mean, our intentions are good, but we're spreading this disease. We need to work on that. And by doing that, by prescribing less opioids, we actually can provide better pain management. We can improve pain better. People will have less suffering from pain, and we can do a better job than we are. So this is a part of the problem. This is from Franz Kafka. Everybody wants a pill for whatever their problem is. You know, the pharmaceutical industry really has promoted that, all these advertisements. There's a pill for whatever ails you. Um, so it's become really, it, it's cultural. People go to the doctor, they want a pill. They don't want advice saying, take ibuprofen and Tylenol and get up and get around and don't sit in, sit in your chair all day. They want a prescription. So we need to learn to talk to folks better. That's, whoops, the, that's my contact information. Again, if you all ever have any questions, I can help you in any way that we know. Are there any questions out there now? Yeah. All right, good. I'll hang around for a little while. Thank you.